Welcome to Sore Mags Writers Cafe, where we share the real writer's life over a cup of friendship, sprinkled with laughter and wisdom. My name is LaShonda Hoffman, and I'm your host. This episode is sponsored by Produce, Publish, Promote, Summit Replay. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our guest today, Sierra London, Pat. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Pat J. O. I knew I was going to mess your name all up. Pat G. O. J. Walker, Denise Walker. Welcome, welcome, ladies. Hello. Thank you. And that's G O R J. G O R J. Yes, I said it in my head, and then my tongue decided not to work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I want to first. We're going to start with Sierra. She's going to tell us a little bit about who she is and what she writes. You have the mic. Okay. Well, hello, LaShonda, and um, thank you so much for inviting me um, to be on Writer's Cafe uh, podcast tonight. Um, Listeners, my name is Sierra London, and I write contemporary romance with a suspenseful edge. At least most days I do. But um, I also have um, paranormal romance and a little crime fiction in my catalog. Um, I've been writing since 2015. I have um, 23 published novels um, to date and five different series. And when I'm not writing, I'm usually hanging out with my husband, who's still active duty, or um, we have two children and I have three grandchildren. So um, I can be quite busy if the little ones are around. And um, that's a little bit about me. Did I say that I started writing after I retired from the military? So, yeah, I did like 23 years active duty Navy um, as a pediatric nurse practitioner and uh, let that go to focus on my writing. So here we are. (laughs) So um, my excerpt. So what I'm going to read for you tonight, um, this is in tribute to Father's Day. I have a series called The Men of Endurance where all the heroes are single dads, and I'm going to read an excerpt from book one called Stay in the Course. And you're going to meet a heroine. Her name is Ivy Summers, and our hero, um, a widower, uh, Owen Tate. And Ivy is kind of a down-on-her-luck girl, who woman who, you know, can do just about anything, and she has just to survive, but she's kind of at her end. Um, the end of her rope when we meet her in this scene. And um, Owen is, you know, he's lost his wife. He's raising a son on his own. And he's a little, you know, he's a little grumpy, (laughs) to say the least. So uh, I'll start now. The exclamation point at the end of Ivy Summer's streak of bad luck came three hours before midnight on a deserted stretch of California's Interstate 80. With fingers stiff from the cold, she barely managed to hold on to the tattered backpack and gather the edges of her peeling secondhand leather jacket. The material felt smooth under her fingertips, the natural texture worn thin from wear and tear. Where was all this chill factor when the scorching June heat had melted the glob of school glue holding the heel of her combat boot in place? How long had she been walking? Her right calf ached from the uneven gait, and the shoe fit could definitely take a back seat to her empty belly. Prepared to give up and turn back, Ivy warmed inside when she saw the faint glow coming from the end of the street. A sign overhead read, no limit, bar and grill. The town of of Endurance definitely had a limit, but that probably didn't welcome wanderers like her. But Ivy reached for the door handle and gave it a firm tug. Nothing happened. Giving it more muscle, she gripped the faded wood, curling the fingers of both hands around the lever and yanked. Still nothing. She felt the tears start to swell in her eyes. Don't cry, Ivy. But a familiar burn started in her nostrils, and then she felt the traitorous tear. Dang it. She was crying. And all of a sudden, the door flew open, and before she knew it, her body was in motion, flying backwards, and her behind hit the cobblestone road. Hard. Crap, she grumbled, followed by a few choice swear words. As she sat on the ground, contemplating her misfortune, it seemed like an invisible bad luck symbol 
etched its way onto her forehead. Mm. A guy, a blonde-haired mountain man with steel blue eyes, glared down at her, his height imposing from this position. She tried to stop her eyes from taking a walk up his impressive form, cowboy boots, dark with age, covered his large feet, denim jeans, too tight, not too tight, not too loose, clung, clung to legs defined with muscles. His thighs looked like he could support her weight for hours. A plaid shirt buttoned up the front did little to conce- conceal his broad shoulders and sculpted abdomen. Well. Those pecs could be one of those sleep right commercials. Every woman she knew would claw her best friend's eyes out to have a chest like his cradling her head. We're closed, he growled, his face locked in a stony expression. She waited for him to extend his hand and help her up. After all, it had been his fault that she fell. She waited some more. Okay, nothing. Rubbing her hands together to rid them of the ground debris, she winced as loose gravel scraped across her braided palms. She looked up at old blue eyes. Your sign says you're open, she said, removing her backpack. He gave the sign a cursory glance and then frowned. I'm not. He bobbed his chin in her direction, and you're trespassing. Unless there was a new ordinance expanding the trespassing rule to include sitting on your butt in a public street, he was wrong. Ivy came to her feet, no thanks to him, and looking up, she craned her neck. Whoa, he was tall and kind of cute in a small-town screwed way. Then you should turn your light off, she said with a scowl. He gave her a twisted smile. Are you from the bank? She reared back and looked at him in confusion. Dressed in her best pair of ripped jeans and an old University of California sweatshirt, there's no way he could mistake her from being from the bank. No, she said, looking at him, a little sass in her tone. Then don't tell me what to do. That's it. <laughs> so what inspired this series? Um, I, um, so it's interesting. I had been, I wanted to write a small town romance and, um, I think I really got inspired by Virgin River. I love um, Robin Carr's Virgin River series. And I have been talking with another author, Olivia Gaines, and she wanted to write a single dad series. And so we was like, why don't we put them together? Why don't we write a small town series where all the heroes were single dads? And the men of endurance were born, was born pretty much. I mean, um, you know, we often think of single mothers, but um, not too often do you see, you know, the large catalog um, series that's featuring single dads. And so that's where the title came from. And it's based on a real town in California, um, Auburn, California. And Auburn is actually the endurance sports capital of the world. So I had the opportunity to drive to Auburn, California, and do my research there. So a lot of the kind of the quirky nuances that you see of the kind of small town that Endurance is, is actually based on Auburn, you know, going there, taking pictures, uh, walking the streets of Auburn. So it's really a fun series to write, and it's kind of lighthearted, especially now, this time of the year. And um, and I think kids always add kind of an extra layer of kind of romance to a story, you know, because you're not just falling in love with a man, but you're falling in love with his child, too. So I had a great time writing the series. Thank you. It sounds really interesting. I have that on my Thank my you. Book. List to read. I got so many books. <laughs> yeah, there's four in the series, and it's complete. So it's the one you can start because I'm all done with it. It's all finished. So if you start now, you'll be able to finish the whole series, which is great. <laughs> I love that, starting the series, and, and all the books are done. Mm-hmm. All right, let's meet Miss Pat. Okay, thank you so much. I really enjoyed you, Sierra. Uh, okay. Once again, Thank you, LaShonda, and hello to all the listening audience. My name is Pat J. Walker, although most people for over the years have always called me Sister Betty. I'm the originator of the Sister Betty Gospel Comedy Series with Kensington Daphina Books, 
And lately, I've kind of started to write something a little different. I kind of came across a situation in my life where I saw too many people were seeking revenge in the church. So I was listening to uh, a sermon by my pastor, and he was talking about that subject, and it just fell into my spirit to write something called Fire in the Water. And the characters are Sanjay Thomas, who was a musician, a very popular musician, but he was very popular with the girls, too. And the other character is Celeste Francois, who was happened to be an author, who was really high up on, you know, the bestsellers list until she met Sanjay. And then things happened to kind of throw them into a path of revenge. And sometimes, you know, we've got to be careful when we start digging them graves. Dig one, you better dig two. So I'm going to just read uh, an excerpt. This is on uh, Celeste. Unlike the pigeons that happily pecked at crumbs on the dirty sidewalk below her apartment, Brooklyn's own unlucky pigeon, Celeste Francois, felt like a hostage. For several years, she had been tied and strangled by the ropes of poverty. She had given in to believing she'd never leave that New York borough and become a dove. She'd been awake since the the sun came on duty earlier, still lying across a full-size bed, summoning all her overweight ancestors to come to her aid. While the weather outside was warm and welcoming that morning, inside Celeste Francois' tiny apartment, a storm was brewing. I am more than a conqueror, she told herself. Unfortunately, no amount of self-convincing or hypnotism in the world could could conquer all her belly fat. She found ways to camouflage it over the past nine years off and on by wearing the latest late-night get-skinny-quick gimmick that never worked. Her daily routine consisted of trying to cram her pounds of the post-pregnancy fat into a pair of plus-size jeans. This don't make no doggone sense, she pined groaning with all the effort. I just bought these a month ago. She rolled her eyes to the ceiling while thinking of a million other things she'd rather do on her 35th birthday. Mama, please hurry. We're hungry. The plea came from her 10-year-old identical twins, Jeanette and John A., her mini-me opinionated girls. When they weren't working her nerves, she did everything to spoil them. She had very little but was filled with determination to give the pair of energetic, coffee-colored, four-foot-nine, 90 pounds of pigtail dawn to evening questioning kids, the love and attention she'd never received from her parents. Looking away from Celeste, the twins twisted their lips, trying to hide the sneer they knew that might bring them closer to a threat of a spanking than they wanted. Under her steely gaze, they swallowed their comments but glanced at each other. With with complaints silently shared, a twin thing they learned at a young age, they continued struggling to balance a huge box between them. The twins had remained silent, but it didn't stop Celeste from ranting as though she'd read their minds. Will you two stop aggravating me? Celeste snapped. Sweat popped from her forehead as she motioned to herself. You two see I'm trying to get dressed? Jeanette, a bit older than her twin by almost three minutes, replied dryly, ain't nobody trying to aggravate you, Mama. One of them moving men say they done you a favor even coming here yesterday and today. He said he's going to just put the rest of your crappy stuff back on the truck. She took a deep breath. He said he's going to drive off if you don't pay them the rest of their money. Jeanette quickly lifted her chin and nodded her, at her twin. Didn't he say that, John A.? John A., following her sister's lead as always, sighed. He sure did. Her hands jerked as she shifted her end of the box, filled to the top with mama's with her mama's good dishes. And I'm getting tired. Celeste moaned and stared at the ceiling. She grimaced and then set her face in a determined mask despite the pain. Maybe it was tiredness that made John A. forget her second-place status. She went full rogue and wasn't through complaining. That other man, she began, the one smelling like a skunk wearing bad vanilla, like you always say when somebody is stinking, said that because you went out a time or two wasn't enough reason to let you slide on the rest, Mama. She sped up to get the rest of her report out. He was even winking like something was in his eyes when he said to tell you that. And then he said real loud, like he wanted everybody outside to hear, that y'all can discuss it like y'all used to. She hunched her shoulders, adding, whatever that means. 
Yeah, but, Jeanette chimed in, that other man with those black ashy ears like a homeless bunny rabbit said that there wasn't going to be no discussion. Just pay him his, she frowned. He said a bad word, money. Defeated, Celeste lowered her head to her chin. Struggling, Celeste threw her head back onto the pillow. Come on now, she gritted her teeth. Her hips bobbed like two overripe cantaloupes with stretch marks. Finally, she announced that she, the jeans made its way to her waist without getting anything caught in its zipper. Celeste slid off the side of the bed and do, didn't do so much as blink. She gestured with a flip of one hand, ordering, sit it in the corner next to the refrigerator. Then she slipped onto a pair of house shoes that once had two-inch heels. Over time, her weight had turned them into a pair of no-inch flats. John A. scanned the room, then looked at her sister as though waiting for Jeanette's approval to speak. Her brown eyes narrowed as she inquired, Mama, where's the rest of the kitchen? When we got here last night, I thought it was bigger. Yeah, Mama, Jeanette added, the last three places we lived, we didn't have to walk out of it and turn around and get to the stove. She tossed a question to her sister. Ain't that right, John A.? John A. nodded. Didn't have to think about opening the fridge first to get inside the oven or the other way around, too. Celeste frowned at the girls, resting her hands on her massive hips. Her head swung between them, giving each the old southern mama's evil eye. The girls gulped and swallowed whatever words were on the tip of their tongues as they trotted away to do as they were ordered. Celeste hung her head, whispering a prayer. Lord, how long do I have to live like this? Can I at least catch a break on my birthday? Not waiting for an answer or truly expecting one, she opened the door and waddled down the steps from her one-bedroom, third-floor walk-up apartment. Those girls deserve better than this, she whispered. It doesn't make no sense. I need to keep moving because I don't always have the rent. When did she stop and rested against a wooden banister for a moment? Two flights down to go and two angry men waited. One wanting money, the other wanting something more. Celeste simply wanted some peace of mind and a better life for her girls. And if life would finally be so kind, she'd also like to get her hands around Sanjay Thomas's neck and send him to his maker. That's the beginning of Celeste's story. All right. A now. fire in the water. Wow. <laughs> that is beautiful. <laughs> Them kids are say, saying they mind, wasn't they? They always do that, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, really? I need uh, to just be quiet. <laughs> That's good. So I have a question uh, for you. Uh, I, okay. I the listeners want to know, will there be another Sister Betty book ever? <clears throat> what did we just talk about? Yes, I'm working on uh, one now. Actually, I'm working on two now. Uh, what happened was some people may know and some people might not know that I lost my husband in uh, 2013, and a lot of the comedy that I was writing uh, in the Sister Betty series just left with him. And it has taken me a while to kind of get back on that footing. So... Uh, now that I am back, it's been like almost seven years, I'm I'm back into it. So the answer to the reader's uh, question is yes, there will be more Sister Betty books. Hope they're happy. Yeah, I told y'all. Denise, you ready? Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you for sharing, ladies. That was awesome. Um, I'm a fairly new author, and um, so I'll tell a little bit about myself first. Um, I began writing, I believe, years ago when I was in college because I found some stories, some children's stories that I wrote, and um, so I'm married, I'm a copy editor, and I actually copy edit children's books and mostly nonfiction, and also I'm a teacher, and I just completed my 20th year as a teacher, um, I'm a podcaster, and I also assist people with their writing and helping to build um, their writing skills as well. And I also do youth mentoring and also speaking to women. And so that's a little bit about myself. And um, so a little bit about my writing. Uh, I write Christian YA, so that's one of the genres that I write. And I also am working on my first women's inspirational novel that is 
based on my story um, of battling with endometriosis and, and being told I can't have children. And, but um, the vision of that book is a little twofold where it has to do with, um, it's called Barren Wound, and it's, it's dealing with the barrenness of needing Christ in your life as well as physical barrenness, dealing with endometriosis. So that's the book that I'm working on right now. And the books that I've written, um, I have five written, and mostly my um, my three words that I focus on when people ask me about my writing is to educate, encourage, and restore. And so the education part of it is I write um, journals, Bible strategy journals that have an English twist because most of my career has been I've taught English, and um, so I take English strategies and I make Bible study journals for youth and also adults. And um, so that's one thing that I write. And then another thing that I write is, again, the fiction. And the restoration part is my vision for helping women and girls understand that they help them restore their identity in Christ and not the identity of um, brokenness and abuse and rejection and, you know, all the different things that I experienced um, growing up as a teenager and even a preteen. And so all the way up into adulthood, I felt that way that I did not know who I was and I did not understand that my identity um, is in Christ. And so that's the vision of my books. And so the series that people are mostly familiar with is um, the first book is Hannah's Hope, and then that's the that's based on my story um, of growing up. And now I've written the second book, which is called Hannah's Heart. And um, the titles have to do with the young girl named Hannah Monroe. She's African American girl, and Hannah's Hope. She's twelve, and then in Hannah's Heart, she's thirteen. And where she has experienced abuse, as I did, and she's as a from a child's perspective, from a teen's perspective, she's trying to understand how to overcome this. And a lot of times what I found as an educator, and most of my career was spent at the middle school, so my books are mainly geared to middle grades because that's where I see them lose their identity and that's where I see them get lost. And so um, that's um, the vision for those books. So again, it's called My True Identity Teen Series, and it's based on Genesis 1 and 27 that says God created man in his own image. And so uh, my message is to teach girls and women that your identity is not abuse or rejection or whatever may um, happen to you, but your identity is what God made in his, in his image. And so um, that's, that's who I am. And I'm going to read just a little excerpt of towards the end of Hannah's heart where her mentor, because I'm a mentor, so, I added a mentor in the in the novel. Um, her mentor is helping a, her and the other group of girls understand who they are. So this, I'm going to read an excerpt of that. <clears throat> All right, so it says, so does everyone remember me talking about your image and trauma in the first session, asked Ms. Silvers. Yes, a few of the girls answered. Well, today we're going to do a lesson titled My True Identity. What's that? Someone asked. Hannah and Alyssa eyed each other, wondering what they were about to do. Her friend, Mouse, are you okay? Hannah nodded and turned to listen to Mrs. Silver's explanation. Well, we have discussed some hard topics because you all have been through some hard stuff. True, Alyssa whispered. The topic of true identity is what we all should have been taught from the beginning. I'm not talking about being identified by your sneakers or name brand clothing, as you know many young people are into today, to cover up their pain. I'm not talking about becoming the next basketball or football superstar, singer, or actress. That may be your gifts and talents. Maybe God has placed you on this earth to be one of those individuals. What I'm talking about is the image you were created in. Okay, one of the girls on the right side of Hannah stated. Hannah and the rest of the girls waited as Miss Silvers picked up her cell phone from the counter up front. They watched as she scrolled through it, looking for something. 
The mentor then stepped over to the whiteboard and wrote Genesis 1 and 27. She then turned back to the group and pointed at the board. Ladies, this is your identity. This is who you are, and I don't want you to ever forget it. I'm going to read it to you. I'm going to read it from one of the word-for-word translations of the Bible. I want you to get the meat of this scripture. It reads, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. What does that mean, Ms. Silvers? Alexa, a girl at the middle table, asked. I'm going to break the scripture down for you. Ms. Silvers clicked on her phone again and sat it on the table <clears throat> closest to the whiteboard. She then walked back over to the board and picked up the black marker. So let's look at the meaning of a few of these words. Ms. Silvers paused again walked over, looked at her phone. She continued, the first important word is God. In this scripture, God means ruler, judge, mighty, and even deity. So if you think about the word president or pastor, this word is the position that God holds. However, he's the only ruler or judge in the true and living God. He is supreme overall. Wow, no one ever really explained that to me, Alyssa whispered to Hannah. Me either, Hannah added, then turned back toward Miss Silvers. The next word that is important is created. God created you, your parents, and everyone else, including the animals and, and angels in heaven. So the word created means to shape, form, or carve out. This would tell us this word tells us that we are not responsible for our existence as people today would have you believe. If God took the time to form and shape us, do you think he made any jump? Do you think he intended for this shaping and forming to be destroyed by life circumstances? No, the girl saying, you are absolutely right. He had a purpose for your life. He loved you enough to make you just the way you are. And you know what else? Miss Silver's turned to pick up the phone again. She clicked on the screen and read over something. Placing it back on the table, she finished her statement. The rest of that scripture tells us that it was his image that he shaped and formed us in. I know at your age, you all can't think beyond growing in your mother's belly. Your mother was the vessel that God used to bring you forth into the world. We look like our parents. Some of us act like our parents. But we are made, I'm sorry, we are made in the image of, of the creator of heaven and earth. So what does image mean? I'm glad you asked. Hannah and some of the girls giggled as Miss Silver's state as, uh, at Miss Silver's statement. Hannah was amazed at the way the mentor was explaining God and how they were created. This is cool, Hannah said to Alyssa. Yes, Alyssa nodded and smiled. So the word image means a representative figure, likeness or shadow. This has to do with us having similar characteristics as our creator. In other words, it's kind of like an imprint. You know how the owner of something can be identified by its imprint? The way goods are identified by their manufacturer, the one that made them? Yes, some of the girls said again, well, you and I have the imprint of God. We are body, soul, and spirit. We are God's represent, representation on the earth. When people see us, they see God's image. The only reason why they mishandle us is because they either don't care about God, don't know about God, or don't fear God, or they may even know, they may not even know who they really are either. And I'm, I'm going to stop there. Mm-hmm. That's good. Wow. Thank you. Encouraging. Yes, yeah, very, yeah. very encouraging. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely spoken in a language that young people can connect with, too. That was my question. I was wondering, how did your audience accept your book? My, um, well, most of the time, the parents are the ones who purchase them. And, uh, but honestly, this year, my fifth graders, I didn't know they found my books online. And they started buying them and, and reading them. And so they started, like, asking me questions about Hannah. And so they, what I found is that kids are, they want to know 
the truth about their identity in Christ. But no, like we're not as adults. I don't think we're thinking that they want to know because what I, my experience is from teaching middle school, a lot of times people say, well, they're just, they're, they're grown, they're, you know, they're hard headed and they don't take the moment, that moment to really sit down and talk to them. And so that has been my experience with, you know, kids from my fifth graders um, were very similar to the sixth graders I taught the year before. I taught um, children church for probably about 15 years and uh, I learned a lot about kids and they're very eager to learn about God if you show it to them in their language, as you said. A lot of people take their kids to church and sit them beside them and the preacher's preaching over their heads. So I always tell people when you're taking your kids to find a, a children's church so they can grow into be able to sit beside you in the church. And most people lose their, their kids to church because they feel like the kids say, oh, it's boring. My kids say, that. oh, it's boring. This is boring. You know, and you have to come down to their level sometimes to to catch them. And then then they do great things because they finally understand their relationship with God. It's not your relationship, it's their relationship. So I'm right. see that, you, you know, um, there's books for kids. I Growing up, there wasn't anything like that for us. So I'm, I, I love when I see books for kids because there's so, they have so many options now versus when we were growing up, we didn't really have that, and especially Christian books. So I think that's wonderful. There's a series on TV. I'm sorry. There's a series on TV called, uh, I think it's called Storybook, and how I found mm-hmm. out about it was John A. kept asking me questions about Esther. And every time I turned around, she wanted to know this about Esther and that about Esther. Then she wanted to know about Moses and then the burning bush. And because I have her iPad synced to mine, um, I get to see what she's watching. So out of curiosity, I happened to uh, click on what she was watching, and it was a program called Storybook. And what they do is they modernize the Bible stories. They put today's kids inside the story. So mm-hmm. the kids are able to to learn and watch what happened from the biblical point of view, but in the modern times. Mm-hmm. And I found that to be very interesting. I mean, she really got into it. Mm-hmm. I, I, I've, you know, doing the children church. I noticed that about kids is they they want to they want to know, but they don't know what to, what to ask. You know, growth. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, so, yeah. Mm-hmm. What I like about um, how you presented, Denise, is there was a point when you were reading where um, you asked about image. What is it? I'm glad you asked. And what I find is, you know, when you craft a story like that, it triggers kids to um, to formulate their own questions. You know, even if they really didn't ask, having a character ask that, you know, triggers them to ask themselves those questions and what they know about the subject that's being presented. And, you know, it stimulates them to to think what do they know, you know, how do they feel about themselves, about um, God and what they, you know, what they what they have learned from the people in their lives. So I love Mm -hmm. the way you way you crafted that as a question for your character to stimulate, you know, our, the kids in our lives to question what they know and what they believe, to ask questions about it. Thank you. Oh. And I think I, I began to do that. I began to um, write questions within my novels because I would, um, when I was growing up, I was told that you can't question God. And so as a kid, I didn't understand what that meant. And for years, I grew up afraid to question God. I thought God was going to, like, literally, because I, in my kid mind, I thought God was going to strike me dead or something if I asked mm. him a question. And so, um, and it wasn't until I was an adult and my pastor, um, some years ago, he said to me, as if he was just prophesying to me, I never said anything to him about it. And he said, um, God said he, he wants you to ask him questions. 
And I was like, what? And that's what made me start asking God a lot of questions about what I had experienced, why certain things happen in the world. And so now I teach, you know, even my son, you can ask God questions. We just have to honor mm-hmm. him as God, but you can, he's the one with the answers. So that's why I use a lot of questioning in my writing. Yeah, I like to be specific with God. Even though I know he already knows, if I'm specific and I, you know, make sure that it's according to his will, not mine, because mine could be kind of, you know, out there, but according to his will specifically, I get answers. They ain't always the answers I'm looking for, but I get an answer. I like that, being specific, because sometimes you ask for stuff and you get it, and it's not what you wanted. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah, I learned to be specific. (laughs) Because he'd be like, I gave you what you wanted. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ain't this what you asked for? Uh-huh. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And just tying yeah, you... that back to to story with what you were saying, Pat, um, that's what I love when we create, you know, these fictional characters. Like I think about Ivy and Owen. <clears throat> you know, she stumbled upon, you know, this man and she was looking for one thing. She was looking for food, but, you know, so oftentimes, you know, God opens up opportunities in a place that we weren't looking for it or mm-hmm. where it's unexpected. And, you know, when we when we create our, our characters, like you can really delve into that and focus on that because sometimes in life that doesn't happen, right? Like the moment is passed before you realize, like, wow, that was like the best thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> but you're already living <laughs> in it before exactly. you realize it. <laughs> that, that, one of the things that I, that I found uh, in exploring the character Celeste in my book was that sometimes we get into a situation where we think we know everything. We know why this happened. Uh, one way and why it didn't happen another way, and then we go looking at scriptures to support why we should be mad about this or why we should go after. I mean, she actually explored scriptures looking for whatever woman there was in the Bible that killed a man. (laughs) She was specific (laughs) about what she wanted to do, and she just wanted God to turn his head just for a little bit while she went after this dude. Oh, yeah. Not knowing that he actually saved her life. But, mm-hmm. you know, that's, that's what we do. We get half of the puzzle, and then we figure out, well, we don't need the rest of it because what we see it has to be reality. Wow. And we yeah. spend so many years being bitter and trying to get back at people who have moved on. They ain't thinking about you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> they have moved yeah. on. Yeah. And then, and then we want God to, to just, you know, like hang our I'll be right back sign at the uh, salvation sign at the altar while we go and do some craziness. And then we want God to fix it. Right. 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 That is so, so true. And you have to be thankful for all the times that, um, you know, he saves us from ourselves. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like you said, oh, before yeah. you go off and, and, uh, and do something uh, crazy you know, that will have lifelong lifelong consequences that, you know, you can't fix like we can in our stories. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then not only that, but if we listen to, listen to the spirit, the stories that we tell, it may not be for us, but I guarantee you it's for somebody. It yeah. is for somebody. Mm-hmm. I guess, he, my eldest brother, when he uh, was in the hospital, he was dying of cancer actually asked me for a Sister Betty story because he wanted to laugh. And I thought that was the most ridiculous thing I had ever heard. Mm -hmm. He wanted to laugh on his deathbed, and he wanted a Sister Betty story. And going through my own cancer, you know, I realized that what I was sharing was not about me. God doesn't really put things on us about us. We're just Mm -hmm. vessels. And yeah. depending on how we accept and then put out what he gives us, we are touching somebody else's life. No man is an island. Mm-hmm. So, so when I yeah. listened to Denise talk about her cancer and her endometriosis, I went through that. Mm-hmm. But my problem was when I was told I couldn't have kids, I had the nerve to get online at the Garden of Prayer, Church of God in Christ, and 
the Bronx, New York, could have everybody that knew how to get through the guard to lay hands on my stomach. Now I'm mm-hmm. sitting up here babysitting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> babysitting grandkids. Yeah. You know what? Amen. You know, Lord, you could have just said no. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, yeah. we, we sometimes we get God off of plan A, you know, we go on plan B, and then we try to find our way back to plan A. And he's, like I used to say, I'd probably give God, a, you know, a headache. He's probably taking Tylenol, messing with me. <laughs> mm-hmm. But you know what? That's what I love about our stories. You know, you're just sharing about um, your brother. You know, I think about before I started writing, I knew what um, books did for me, like the the – the world that they created that may not have been my reality oftentimes. You know, it was my own little escape. But it, it, it didn't really strike me as how many people are moved by our work and what we put mm-hmm. on the page until I became a published author and other readers and authors started to reach out to me and share their own stories and how the words on the page or on the e-reader moved them. And, you know, that's a ministry in and of itself, you know, being able to, you know, craft a story in a way that more than just you can interpret that story and that it has impact on someone else's life, you know. And I do consider this, you know, my writing to be a part of our min- my ministry, you exactly. know. Just, um, exactly. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. I do comedy. That's what I, my comedy, when I perform, that's my ministry. So mm-hmm. even though I'm performing comedy, I always end with the message. I just use comedy to suck them in, <laughs> you know, and then I give mm-hmm. them the message at the end. And, but yeah. God will come at you the way that you, he needs you to come to him. We all can't come to God the same way. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. And I found meet you even, that. Um, my with my teen series, or there's women that's reading it, and they're they contact me and say, Denise, you know, this is my story that you're writing. I I don't re- mm-hmm. I didn't remember this stuff um, happening, but you know, now I can understand what God wants me to to identify to find my identity, you know, in Him, and um, and I thought it was more you know of teen girls, but now it's women that's reading them, so. Mm-hmm. Well, do you think that might be because some things that perhaps men too, but since we're speaking about women right now, that we go through, that even though we grow older in age, we still have not gone beyond that experience? We are still stuck at the time, you know, uh, the, the age of whenever the experience happened. We're still I there. Do. I do, because I was that person. And it, me too. It took me until I was about <laughs> 40 to wreck it to you know for God to begin to heal me from what happened to me when I was a kid and so I was a grown mm-hmm. woman but I, I started saying well God why do I do certain things like I wouldn't I didn't trust people um hey, and girl, can we when, talk <laughs> and when it came to my my son I was like terrified that somebody was going to do something to him and it was so much that and and God began to show me it had everything to do with what I had gone through as a kid and I was a grown up but I still was battling with it so yeah exactly and, and you know it's it's not strange that you say that but you just told my story Mm-hmm. And I became so overprotective of my kids that all I did was just I stifled them. So the stupid stuff that they did later on in life, they could have done that when they were younger. If I wasn't always standing in front of the bus, <laughs> you know, wow. trying to keep the bus from hitting them, when I should have let the bus just run over their toes, <laughs> and they would have learned. But we do that sometimes. We, we, t- we carry the burden of whatever our experiences were. In, in my case, it was molestation, you know, mm-hmm. and it was family. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, and I didn't care who it was. You were not going to stay near my girls, and don't let me catch you looking at them sideways. Mm-hmm. And what I did was I really, um, I stifled them. That's just plain and simple. I stifled it. I didn't want them to go nowhere. I didn't want anybody to watch them. I didn't want anybody to do this, do that. You know, I'll do it. 
And what I ended up doing was taking on so much on myself that I began to stifle me. Because mm. I couldn't grow for watching them and watching everybody else that was watching them. So I understand completely what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. And now my and son, a- he'll say, he'll say to me, Mom, I'm 16 now. You can trust me, that, you know. And and so sometimes mm-hmm. he'll, even if I get overprotected, he's like, he'll just say something to me. And then sometimes he'll say, "Mom, did you pray about this?" And I'm looking like, "Really?" So he, <laughs> you know, God'll use him to say something mm-hmm. to me. Well, I know when, when God turned me around, it was I wanted something so bad, and I never forget. I was in church and I was just crying out to the Lord, and God told me straight up. He said, "If you don't forgive him, I cannot forgive you, mm-hmm. and you cannot move on." And at that very moment, it's like it's not like I didn't know that. I knew that for years, but at that very moment, when the Spirit spoke to me, it was with such conviction that when I left the church, I called and left a message telling him, I forgive you. The strange thing was he was in a coma, and my aunt said he couldn't hear me. He couldn't hear her. But I still got that off my chest, and I moved on. And then I also found out, Denise, that I felt kind of comfortable being mad, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, there was a, I'm not going to lie, there was a little bit of comfort in being mad. Right. Okay. So I carried that chip on my shoulder for a long time. You know, how dare you? Mm. And it was convenient. Mm-hmm. Right. right. Yeah. Easy to stay stuck than to move past it. You know, you have to trust. Mm-hmm. You got to trust in yourself. You got to trust that you can move past it. And a lot of people, you know, are when you when stuff like that happens to you as a child and you don't get past the trauma, it goes with you all the way through your life. Eventually, you have to face that trauma of why you know you you're either angry or you you block it out. But your your children do suffer from it. Different things. I was telling my sister about some stuff that I didn't do because of my mom, because of stuff she went through as as a teenager. She didn't. She got thrown in the water. So she wouldn't let us learn how to swim when you should learn how to swim. <laughs> but she was mm-hmm. traumatized by swimming. Somebody threw her in the deep end of the water and she almost drowned. And she was like, don't go near the water, you know. And, right. And that was, yeah. that, that, as a kid, she was like, you can go, but you can't get in the water. Who wants to go to a pool and you can't get in the water? You know? <laughs> right. You know, but well, Sonda, you bring up an excellent point because I think what we've learned, especially as adults, is that all growth doesn't have to come out of trauma, right? Mm-hmm. Something trauma, traumatic or mm-hmm. tragic doesn't have to happen for us to grow. We can be nurtured and loved and grow as well. Like we don't have to throw you in the water before you learn how to swim. We can take you to the pool and hold your head and, you know, graduate from, you know, on the side to out in the water. And, you know, it it takes a while to admit that even as parents, you know, that everything we did or that we do, you know, maybe wasn't the best option, Mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Like we could have done things differently. Yeah, and I I chose that when my kids were – they said to teach him young, and so I took my daughter. She learned how to swim. My two-year-old, he's like, he's not getting in that water. And <laughs> I don't know if he ever, <laughs> to this day does he like getting in the water. But, you know, I, I was going to break that cycle because I missed out on so much going to the pools and stuff with my friends because she was scared. She was literally scared of the water, and she was like, mm-mm, not going to happen, <laughs> you know. Well, you know, also it it depends on the environment that we lived in when it, when whatever the experience we had occurred. Because I lived with my grandparents mm-hmm. in the south, and back during those days, whatever happened at home better stay at home. Right. And children were seldom believed. You know, seldom believed. So when you come out of a situation like that, you learn to hold a lot in because you figure, why am I going to say anything? Ain't nobody going to believe me. Mm-hmm. You know, so you, then you start 
transferring that to other situations in your life. You know, why am I going to say anything? Don't, don't nobody care. And then that starts to affect your health. And I ended up with all kinds of stomach problems and headaches and all kinds of stuff until, you know, one day as an adult, and my husband got upset with me and said, if you don't get mad, because he didn't know what was wrong with me, he said, if you don't get mad, he said, I don't know what else to do with you. So I'm not proud of it, but I cussed him out. <laughs> and I felt better. Mm-hmm. I never did it after that, you know, but I felt better, and I was cured. Mm-hmm. You had to release it. <laughs> I had to release it, and fortunately he loved me enough to let me release it on him. Mm. Well, you know what? We went through a whole different thing. We ain't asked none of my, I ain't asked none of my questions, but this has been a good Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and this is what I'm talking about, about being at the cafe. You don't know what's going to happen at the cafe. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to blame that on Denise. We were going to talk about different things. And um, one of the subjects we were going to talk about was the advance. And I, I still want to talk about that a little bit because when um, when I got into writing, I was with the RWA. And we did they did a series about the contracts and how the contracts were different for white authors compared to the black authors. At that time, it was just Arabesque had just came out, and so they were showing how the writers were getting like two hundred and fifty dollars, whereas Harlequin was paying like twenty five hundred, and nobody wanted to talk about it. And that was I was new, so I'm I'm want to know why why we can't talk about salaries, why we can't talk, why can't you tell me what's going on? So when it's my turn, I know what to expect, what not to do, what to do, you know. And I think in the African American community that not talking has really hindered us because you're getting two hundred fifty dollars when your partner is getting five thousand, and and you don't. You you happy with the two fifty because you think that's great and they like they're going up the scale and we're staying at two fifty, you know. And when they get to that this this week, they've been talking about uh, the advances and the white authors were telling what they were getting and the black authors look you know in shock. Some people were in shock. I was not in shock because this has been going on for twenty years. It's not nothing new. Mm-hmm. It's been this issue for years. But the newbies are like, what, what? You got a hundred thousand dollars advance, and you, you got fifteen thousand. Did you did they read that book? And you won how many awards? And this person didn't even win any awards, you know. And it wasn't. It's not about the awards, you know. Um, I'm gonna be quiet and ask you guys how you feel about this topic. Well, well, you already um, know how I feel this, about it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is Sierra, and you know. It's a systemic problem. It's not just publishing. Mm -hmm. But I will say there are so many forces that um, people of color are up against. When you think about the implications of being underpaid for your entire working life, Mm -hmm. because that's basically what you're describing. If you're saying my same quality book, earns $500 and somebody else's earns $5,000, you know, they're making 10 times the amount of money that I am over the course of a career. And yet so many times we as um, people of color get the message, pull yourself up by your bootstrap. Well, how am I going to pull myself up by my bootstrap as high as some of these other people when systematically I'm being underpaid, undervalued for my entire working life. And when you compare women, you know, black women, we make money than, you know, white men, white women, (laughs) um, black men, then it becomes a cycle, you know, a cycle of a life where, you know, the system that's put in place is trying to deprive us of the same American dream. You know what I'm saying? So I'm glad to see people are talking about, you know, hashtag publishing paid me because we do need to address it. And I feel like as a culture, you know, black people 
um, in particular, are taught not to talk about things in the house. I think Pat talked about, like, what happens Mm -hmm. at home stays at home, what happens in the house stays in the house. And that very much translates into how much money is flowing into the house, right? You don't talk about it. You may not even ask, you know, somebody in your family how much money they make. You never know. Mm-hmm. You know, I never knew how much my daddy made my whole life, you know. <laughs> so I think it's kind of ingrained, but it is a conversation that needs to be had because, like you said, Lashonda, you think, you know, I'm making good money until you find out the person next to you that's producing the same product is making three or four times more than you. So I'm glad the conversation is happening. Well, I'm I'm glad that there's also a choice. Like I Mm -hmm. mentioned before, I told them what I wanted. They offered much more than what I settled for. And I gave them the reason why I settled for it, because when when these certain amount is sold, say $10,000, $15,000, because, you know, there's so many parts that go into the advance and into your royalty statement, you know, the, the, the su- supplies that are set aside, you know, the returns and all this. At the end of the year, I want my money. So give me what I'm asking for. You can keep all that other, you know, stuff that you wanted to give me. Give me my money. I don't want 10 years from now I'm still owing you for that book. But that's just me. And like I said, I come at it from a different perspective because I, in the recording industry, in the music industry, advances, I mean, all these people that you see with these big homes, you know, the, the artists, well, they ain't the homes. <laughs> That's not theirs. You know, even with the publishing or whatnot, it's not theirs. So, I mean, it's just, that's just been my experience. And it's probably different for you guys, you know, and everybody else, but that's the mindset that I came to the literary field with. I'm going to treat y'all just the way I was treated, you know, in the music industry. Give me my my little bit of money now, what I consider, Mm -hmm. you know, a little bit of money. Let me earn out and then give me my real money. And it worked fine for me. Uh-oh, I hear silence. I, don't, I think a lot of people don't look at that you get the $100,000, but do you get any royalties? You know, because if you don't, like you said, if you don't earn out the book, then you don't see any royalties ever. So that that's all you have exactly. is that 100000 And from what I'm I'm told, you, you it's divided three ways. So you're not getting the whole 100000 at one time. You're getting Oh, no, not, definitely not. Mm-hmm. Quarter, so you got to live off of that because I, I talk to people, all, I mean, artists all the time and they think, oh, I'm going to get this big advance and I'm going to quit my job and I'm going, okay. <laughs> yeah, you better keep that yeah. job. You better get you another one. Right. You want a little research. Yeah. Ask people about the wrong yeah. check because, you know, yeah. that, that 50000 that are going to last just a little bit. It's not going to last a long time. So you got the next year you got to think about, and you only getting $2 royalty checks, it's not going to work. Do you, do you remember when Publishers Weekly, I don't know if they still do it now, when they used to publish the uh, who got certain amount of monies and whatnot for their, uh, for their book acquisitions? I don't know if they're still doing that, but when yeah. I, I remember back in the 90s, I think it was, when I first started, uh, in the publishing side, they used to publish that, you know, such and such got such and such amount of money for this deal, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was out there. Mm-hmm. People might not have paid too much attention to it, but it was out there. Well, people were watching it, but the African Americans weren't getting that, so that was the problem. <laughs> you know, you think, oh, I got a book. You know, you 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 cheer on your friend. They they finally got the publishing thing and. You know, I, when, when I started the magazine, I was able to ask the questions that I've been wanting to know. You know, I'm like, well, well, well how, I, I remember asking a lady, she had just got her contract, and I was all excited for her and stuff. And I said, well, my goal when I get a contract is to buy me a computer. I said, is it enough to buy me a computer? You know, back then, it was like $1,000, $1,500. You know, but, uh, like, I'm not you? laughing at you. <laughs> yeah. I was, I understand. Like, 
I wasn't trying to be in her business, but I was like, I just need to know if it's enough to cover a computer because I'm writing on a typewriter, you know? And she's like, right. she's like, honey, keep your day job. Oh, Save up on your computer. And I was like, oh, yeah. no. And that bugged yeah. my bubble for a long time because I was like, is that not, what's the point? What's the point of me giving you this book that I done wrote, 350 pages, and I'm not going to get anything from it, you know? And it's like, and this is what people used to tell me. It, but you're published. And I'm like, I need money. I know. <laughs> I understand that I'm published, but I, I no, I, I'm not going to get paid. I had people who worked with the publishers who they didn't get paid. And they didn't get books. They, they you know, they wait. I mean, there's, there's a lot that there's a lot that we have to contend with. You got to contend with the publishers who aren't paying you. Sometimes right. you got to contend with uh, your 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 agents who are ripping you off. Then you have to contend with people who are supposed to be publicists that are getting your books and then reselling them instead of you know. I mean, I went through it all. Right, and this is the trust I me. I went through it all. <laughs> The horror side that they don't tell you about because you need to know that you know you're going. Oh to be, yeah. Oh, it's gonna be this. It's gonna be that. I, and I talk uh, the clients when they come to me, they're pissed off. It's, you know, the piss is not. They told me they're gonna promote me and they they haven't done anything. You know, and I'm like, you is it in writing? Because if it's not in writing of what they're gonna do, then they're not gonna do it. You know, and so. People go into this thinking, uh, oh, I'm going to get these big contracts. I'm going on a book tour. Yeah, I, I know a bunch of people still waiting on their book tour. They, it is not going to happen right. later, you know. And so and wow. there's certain people that go on book tours. There's certain, you know, you, what's that, the me list? And then the, what, is, what is, is the next level underneath that? You the next level underneath that. So you, no, you're not going <laughs> to. <laughs> yeah. Well, but, you know, you know, I'll tell you like, I'm I like I used to tell the people, in, in, when I would go to meetings, you know, and when I was in the music industry, I'd always bring a jar of Vaseline with me and just sit it on the table. They <laughs> <laughs> just tell, leave me with a little dignity. That's all I'm asking for. Oh and I know I wasn't getting a dinner, no kiss, none of that. I just bring my own Vaseline, just sit it right there on the desk. I think yeah. of Ice Cube in his, in, his, in his song when you say that. <laughs> Yeah. It's true. No, they tell you real quick, you know, just, you, you can walk in. If you ever learn how to walk in just holding your own ankle, just bend over, you know, just go on in there and get it over with. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't be but too rough. Just leave say, a little dignity. Yeah. Go ahead. But I will say that, um, you know, when you were talking about royalties, I think this is why we've seen so many authors you know, either go independent publishing or start a hybrid career where they have some of their titles that are with a publishing house and then some of them independently, mm -hmm. where they have full creative control, you know, over their work, but as well as their marketing plan. Uh, mm -hmm. Because if our counterparts can be paid that type of money, then that means mm -hmm. there's that type of money to be made in this industry. And um, I think it's really important, you know, whether you're a hybrid um, or independent or traditionally published, to really partner and study the industry and work with other authors who have um, created pathways that really help to generate an income because it is very much possible. Um, but you do have to align yourself with, you know, authors who know how to do that. And it takes a lot of time and energy. You know, it's not like the publishing house back in the day where, you know, they had huge departments that did a lot of these things for you. Marketing budgets, marketing departments have strength tremendously in publishing houses. And even for t traditionally published authors, you know, they still have to learn how to market their books. They have to know, you know, who their audience, um, who the audience is, how to reach them where they are, how to target them, and put money behind it. Mm -hmm. It's going to take both. The, I mean, there's millions of books being produced every year, and it's a very crowded marketplace. But um, it's still a very, can be a very lucrative career. 
Well, thank you for saying that because uh, I don't want to discourage people. But I, I, I see people who are doing well, and then I see some people who aren't. And, you know, and, and that's who you hear most of about now is those are, that aren't. And they, they retire and they're done with these people. The big people not buying their books. They hate readers, and readers hate them. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Like, and it's oh, okay, I haven't experienced that like yet, that. but okay. <laughs> they feel like that, you know, and it's like, oh, no, you know, but I believe that there is a reader for everyone. There, you right. Oh, reader, yeah. Not reader, yeah, definitely. For everyone, and you just have to know how to get in front of them, but you have to make time to do that. I say that all the time. You you have to make a plan, so how are you going to get yourself in there, you know, and, and, and get your piece of the pie? Because they're not passing the pie out. <laughs> you got to go in there and get your piece, you know. And so that's what I, I teach is try to get your, get, your, get your piece of the pie, too. And you can do it, and you can have a successful career, you know, if you don't go with the big publishers. You and, be very but much at the so. end of the day, very it's the so. author that's going to sell the book. So, exactly. I mean, you know, I've seen, I've seen authors who are so, act so snooty that, even if I love the story that they wrote, I would not buy their book. So mm-hmm. I, when I talk to authors, I tell them all the time, it, most of the time the readers are buying you. Mm-hmm. And people so, have you know, just right. remember that. <laughs> they are buying you. And even, like, for me, being still being, you know, fairly new, and I'm connected with Christian authors that tell me the same stories. Like, um, you know, they, that's why – a lot of them have become independent because they've been ripped off and things like that. But I also see, you know, like um, my teen series book is in a bookstore here in the the Atlanta area. And like you were saying, I was excited because some of the like big authors come in there and, and then I'm looking at them. They don't, some of them don't speak. Some of I'm like, really? Mm -hmm. So you want people to just buy your book? because your name is whoever and they they will walk past you or and I just mm-hmm. I find that you have to be more personable and so I said as I'm learning I'm I love it when um I meet authors that are very personable because I've seen authors that I was like oh man I remember this author and they've been writing for a long time and they just walk past you like mm. and or well, you, you know you know events we would have like a book signing at the bookstore and the, those of us that were, you know, fairly new authors, we had to be there like an hour ahead of time. And these authors would walk in two hours later. And so I'm looking like, as, and I guess that's that teacher side of me, like, really? Did you just show up? And and so <laughs> it is just like that kind of etiquette and stuff like that that I look at too. Well, mm-hmm. can I give you a, a prime example of someone that I've known for years who has not changed with all the success that she has, and that's Kimbla Roby. I remember Kim when Kim uh, had the book Casting the First Stone, and it was going to be done as a play at a church. She has still remained the same humble person that I met almost 20 years ago. I, I and I think that, that a lot of that has to do with her success. She can sell a book with it just just by her name alone, because of the way she presents herself, the way she carries herself. I mean, I've never heard anything bad about her, and I've heard some bad stuff about some other very popular authors, mm-hmm. but she never her, about her. She treats her Jacqueline her, Thomas her is another like one. Old. That's why the readers the readers will tell on you. And uh, oh I yeah, Kimberly, the, and on Facebook, her first book, and we finally met. <laughs> I think two years ago we met face to face, but she has always been, you know, uh, a very humble person, and I yes. think that that comes across. And readers see that. Readers are they support you. You know, she had a series that's gone on for a long time, and I don't think she thought it was going to go on that long, but it had. And and it was because she had supportive readers that wanted to, you know, they wanted the series to go on. And when she goes to an event, she is there until the last reader leaves out of there. You know, exactly. Some people, some people are like, well, I'm done with my books. I'm out of here. I've seen people that wouldn't even talk to you unless you were buying the book. You know, it's like, wow. <laughs> I 
But, you know, you get what you put in. And I believe she put in mm -hmm. good stuff, and that's why she's lasted as long as she has. Some other I started this 20-some years ago, and I can tell you some of the people that started with me are not still here. <laughs> exactly. So. Do you remember when we used to have a, um, a group called Authors, Helping Authors, that was started by Dolores Thornton? Mm -hmm. And it was a situation where if you lived on the West Coast and I lived on the East Coast and I wanted promotion, I would just send you my stuff to the West Coast, you send me your stuff to the East Coast, and wherever I went, I would take your stuff, and wherever you went, you would take my stuff. I don't see that anymore. We used to have flyers that would have all wow. the horses on there. We used to do all of that. We did all, Victoria Christopher Murray, Jacqueline Thomas, uh, me, uh, um, oh, I'm looking at a face and I can't call her name now, Andrew Bowen, I mean, so many. Dolores Thornton, mm -hmm. we would, Perry Brown, we would take each other's stuff mm -hmm. wherever we went. All you had to do was ship it to, to one another. I don't see that anymore. You, you mm. weren't afraid of sharing your, your audience. This generation is scared of sharing their audience. That You know, you have people, oh, oh, they might steal my audience. Nobody can steal your audience. You don't believe Exactly. <laughs> You know, and I and I think that has hurt a lot of people too because they don't want to they don't want to collaborate. I was going to talk about collaboration too, but we'll move on. <laughs> you ladies, we have gone over our time, but I really enjoyed listening to you all talk and and give the wisdom that you shared. And um, we need breaks. We didn't take no breaks and that. So <laughs> well, can we give our can we give our websites you. real quick? Yes, I'm going to give you a chance to tell us uh, how to work okay. with you uh, offline and online. Um, so we'll start with Sierra. Okay, thank you so much, ladies. I had a uh, I had a wonderful night with you, and you can find me most days on um, Facebook at um, Sierra London Books. So please follow me there. My website is Sierra, S-I-E-R-A, so that's one R, London, L-O-N-D-O-N, author, A-U-T-H-O-R.com, SierraLondonAuthor.com. So check me out. All my books are available on um, Amazon in print and in digital format. And I look forward to connecting with you on Instagram or Facebook or, if need be, Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Pat? You're welcome. Okay, you can reach me as well at Sister Betty, S-I-S-T-E-R-B-E-T-T-Y dot com. Um, I'm, all my websites are connected to that name, so if you just type that in, you can just, you know, you'll find me. You can also find me on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and um, I guess I've been out here so long. I'm just all over the place. You, you'd have to trip. you trip over me no matter where you went. And I just want to say thank you. I had such a wonderful time. It was informative, and it was so nice to be around people who don't mind sharing. And Shonda, thank you so much for the invite. Thank you for yeah. being on. Ms. Denise? Thank you, ladies. I learned so much. This was really awesome. I learned so much from you all is um, just listening to you. And um, you can find me at denisemwalker.com, Denise, D-E-N-I-S-E-M, as in Michelle, walker.com. And I'm also on um, Facebook as author Denise M. Walker. I sometimes use Twitter and um, Instagram as well. All right. Well, thank you so much, ladies, for being the guest tonight. Yes, have a lovely night. I would like to thank our sponsors for this episode, the Produce, Publish, Promote Summit replay. Check the link in the show notes to order your replay. I want to thank you, our listeners, for taking time to listen to the podcast. I have three questions for you. Did you enjoy this episode? If you did, subscribe to the platform you're listening to so you don't miss an episode. What did you think of the episode? Tell us by writing a review. 
Did you learn something from this episode? If you did, please share the podcast with your community. If you have a topic you want us to discuss in the cafe or you would like to be a sponsor of one of our episodes, contact me at onesormag at gmail.com. One last question. Have you promoted your book or business today? If you haven't, go showcase those wings. Someone needs what you have to offer. This is LaShonda Hoffman, and I'll see you on the next.